Good evening. Welcome to the first event in the Embrace Ambition series. We are thrilled to see you all here and welcome to the many people watching on live stream. I'd like to start by putting this evening into context. Two years ago, we launched the Embrace Ambition Initiative with a public service announcement featuring lots of extraordinary women. That message resonated around the world, so much so that last year we had a summit to go further and explore issues of stereotypes and unconscious bias. Fast forward another year, and we're here. Um, we decided to bring the conversations to cities across the United States in 10 smaller events, starting here in Tory's hometown of Philadelphia. Because we believe these conversations are so important, we do not put a price tag on them. Instead, we invite people to apply to attend. When we opened up applications for the Embrace Ambition events, within a day, we had 1,200 applications. And when we ended, we had more than 2,000 submissions. And these weren't just a little check the box. These were people writing essays. But what was extraordinary about the applications wasn't the sheer number of them, but the stories that they told. Over MLK weekend, I curled up and I read every single one of them. I was humbled, inspired, and in awe of the resiliency and empathy that poured off those pages. I also realized that some of the best content for our Embrace Ambition evenings was staring me in the face. Tonight, and at our events this week in Chicago, San Francisco, and Dallas, you will hear some of these personal statements. We're gonna begin and end our program with them. But before we start, a few points. First, an enormous thank you to our sponsor of this evening's program, SAP. Following the first two statements, Jennifer Morgan, executive board member of SAP, will introduce our first speaker. Jennifer, in addition to being such a good friend of the foundation, just happens to be on both Forbes and Fortune's most powerful women lists. We're so happy she's here. <laughs> Following that, our first speaker will be interviewed by Samantha Barry, the editor-in-chief of Glamour Magazine. We are extremely grateful to Glamour for live streaming our event this evening. Now, to begin the program, it is my great pleasure to introduce our audience speakers. Presenting first will be Emily Scott, the owner of Compendium Boutique and founder of Dance Happy. And following Emily will be Anna Mushreff, Global People Officer at Siemens and founder of For You Social. Emily? Good evening. My name is Emily, and my first employee was Julia, a young woman who just happens to have Down syndrome. Despite her challenges with expressive language, I found tasks that worked within her capabilities, and we quickly formed a friendship. Over the course of the next six years, Julia went from being um, an intern to a paid employee to now a co-founder of a new venture together. Along with our friend Liev, Julia and I founded Dance, Dance Happy Designs. We are a design stu a print studio um, that screen prints textiles featuring original patterns that are all hand cut by Julia. In addition to being our co-founder, our equal co-founder, Julia is also our lead pattern designer and co-screen printer. We are three friends on a mission to empower others and celebrate differences. We wanna show what is possible when someone who would normally be overlooked is given an opportunity to spread her wings and live her truth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tori, and the women of the foundation for having me. So, my name is Anna Mushraf. I think the story of gender biases and racial discrimination should be an old one now. I really wish it was. I grew up as an American-born Muslim woman in a post-9-11 world. That probably doesn't mean a lot to you unless if you've experienced it personally. 
Being raised with a different type of mindset, I got married at a fairly young age because that's what I thought was the right thing to do. It was a weak and a complicated marriage, and I felt that the universe had stronger plans for me. I accepted the fact that when I divorced, I would become uh, an outcast from my community, which is what happened. Despite that challenge, I found that life and its sweet trickery soon revealed its other plans. Shortly after my divorce, I was offered an opportunity to work in Germany, which changed my life yet again. In settling in abroad for the first time, I realized how absolutely American I was and am. Wearing a hijab, many people only saw an Auslander or an outcast, someone that wasn't like them. I couldn't even begin to imagine who people thought I was. I just missed going to Trader Joe's and going to the Starbucks drive through just like anybody else. It was the little things. In addition to skewed perceptions, the experiences that I had working in a primarily male-dominated environment really knocked the wind out of me sometimes. Sometimes we realize that there are just people that don't realize that they don't know better. I've come to learn that there's great opportunity in that. I started a small organization called U4 Social. It's a social growth community focusing on developing better skills, networks, and knowledge for women. With U4, I work as a coach, facilitator, journalist, with a number of organizations helping to develop and equip and elevate women. The grit that I've, that I've had to gain sometimes dims the characteristically optimistic sparkle in my eyes. But I do, however, believe that I'm building and I'm toning strong muscles for myself to show people that with diplomacy, poise, and clever kindness, that we must treat each other better. We must act as better humans and be and see beyond our outer shells. And we must communicate with heart. I've learned that the hard way. And as it is with all hard lessons, we tend to not let ourselves forget them. Thank you. Thanks so much, that was wonderful. My name's Jennifer Morgan, I'm with SAP, and we're so proud to sponsor this event and the Tory Burch Foundation. This is a natural for us, for our company, uh, not just because we happen to be headquartered here locally in the area, but because we so completely identify with the vision and the goals of the Tory Burch Foundation. It's a wonderful thing when someone uses their own achievements to create opportunity for others. And Tori is such an example of this for all of us because she reminds us that the best kind of success is shared success. Thank you for sharing tonight with us and for sharing these amazing leaders with us tonight. Embracing ambition, of course, is about embracing the gifts that each of us have and having the chance for, for us to use them in full. Combine a woman's talents with a sense of confidence, purpose, and the encouragement of other women and there's no end to the good that will follow. I've seen it many times, and all of us have seen it already in the short time that we've been together tonight with these remarkable women before us. I'm excited to introduce you to the next speaker. She's 16 years old and a proud cadet at the Delaware Military Academy. The academy is centered around the core values of honor, courage, commitment, and these are evident in the discipline and mission focus of this amazing high school sophomore. A good number of young women already owe their inspiration to our next speaker and to the Wilmington Urban STEM initiative that she founded. The title of her TED Talk, she already has a TED Talk, <laughs> captures perfectly the spirit of the enterprise, today's girls, tomorrow's scientists. Meeting her this evening, I found myself hoping today's cadet, tomorrow's SAP colleague, maybe we can talk. <laughs> Because this is a kind of young woman who lifts people up and makes great things happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Means. Oh, just a little nervous. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Jacqueline Means. I'm 16 years old and I am the proud founder of the Wilmington Urban STEM Initiative. Now STEM, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
and I have always loved science. I remember when I was little, I would mix baking soda and vinegar everywhere I could because I loved the bubbles and the fizz. Um, but I come from Southbridge, Wilmington. Now, Southbridge has been dubbed Murdertown, USA by Newsweek due to the high number of shootings and just violence that happens there. And growing up in such a negative community, I decided that when I got older, I had to do something positive because I don't want people to get this idea that Wilmington is all negative. I wanted to put positivity out into the world. I wanted to do everything in my power to make Wilmington more positive, so I founded my initiative. Wilmington Urban STEM Initiative is a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing STEM to the young girl, underprivileged girls of Wilmington. I specifically target girls aged 6 to 13 because studies have shown that within that age range, girls already have decided that science and math are too challenging and too boring for them. Now, that's not, that's not the case. I have always loved science, and I will continue to be an advocate, advocate for it long after I've graduated high school. With only 29% of the STEM workforce being female, I figured if I could get girls interested in STEM at a young age and show them that STEM is actually really fun through doing really fun science experiments at my girls' empowerment STEM events, I could increase that percentage from 29 to as high as possible. Through my organization, I host my girls' empowerment STEM events, which is a fun, creative way I found to get girls involved with STEM by doing hands-on science experiments. And I'm sure you all have heard of slime. There's been a big slime craze in these past two years. <laughs> We always make slime. And slime sounds simple, but when the girls get to use borax, which is the, um, the chemical name for it, is sodium tetraborate, and they get to mix that with the water, with the food dye, with the glue, and they see the, the substance become tacky right before their eyes, they're seeing a chemical reaction, and they don't even know it. They say, Miss Jackie, Miss Jackie, come look. And I'm like, I know, it's really awesome. <laughs> My goal is to inspire a younger generation of girls to pursue educations and careers in STEM fields. It's imperative that we, as a society, utilize all available talent and potential, because the future is female. I want to show them that aiming high is a realistic goal, and by believing in one's own abilities and working hard, it's possible to face any challenge with grace and overcome any obstacles that, that may come their way. I want, to, I want to let them know that they can better their circumstances for the betterment of everyone. I mean, who knows? One of these girls who comes to my event when they're six or seven may grow up to find the cure for Alzheimer's. I want to show them that they can overcome negative stereotypes and dominate in STEM fields where we remain underrepresented. underrepresented. I believe that each girl is valuable and capable of reaching goals that seem unachievable. They just need to be shown that. I offer them living proof by holding steadfast to my own standards of excellence and achievement. In other words, I walk the walk and don't just talk the talk. By letting the girls know I live right here in the same community as they do and that they don't have to fall into the typical negative stereotypes, I offer them hope as a role model, teacher, and friend. Now today is all about embracing ambition, which is exactly what I did when I founded my initiative. So if anyone in here or anyone watching is waiting to go out and get a new job or go back to school, it can't wait. Embrace your ambition today because now is the time. I started by volunteering with one hour, and then I said, hey, you know, these girls are pretty cool. I think I'll do two hours, four hours, and then it consumed my everyday life, but I love it because I embraced my ambition and my passion to give back and get girls involved with STEM. So I ask you today, embrace your ambition. Thank you. We can't let it leave it, leave it that. Hi, guys. I'm Samantha Barry. I'm the editor-in-chief at Glamour, and I feel sitting next to the 16-year-old like the biggest underachiever of my life, if I'm being <laughs> honest. Um, your story is amazing. Thank you. And you're, you are an inspiration, especially for young women. And this whole idea of embrace ambition is, is really about women reclaiming that word ambitious. When you hear the word ambitious, what do you think? What, what does it mean to you? When I hear ambition, I think of someone who's a go-getter, who doesn't let someone saying, oh, you need to stop, you need to relax. They're like, no, I'm going to give a thousand percent to whatever I'm doing. That's what I hear. That's what I think. You have an amazing academic achievement at such a young age. Um, was there ever anywhere along the way that somebody told you you were being too ambitious or... Little. Thankfully, I have not heard you're too ambitious, but people have said, why don't you relax? Jackie, calm down. Um, and people have questioned why I'm so active in my community and active in getting girls involved with STEM. And I tell them, 
I'm surrounded by negative stereotypes, and if I can assist one girl or two girls in breaking down those negative barriers, that's exactly what I want to do through STEM. So let's talk about that, because everybody talks about STEM, and we're, we talk about getting people into the pipeline in university and school. You're going much younger than that. You are getting them as they come out of infancy and when they're really, the, the curiosity uh, is at, at its highest, I suppose. Um, do you have any story in particular that stands out of one young woman or one young girl that you've worked with that you really have changed her mind about science or math or engineering? So at my Girls Empowerment STEM events, it is a full day. I bring girls from all over the city of Wilmington to come and do science experiments and also talk to inspiring female speakers like Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. But when the girls come, they kind of walk in like, what are we doing? What's going on? Um, and I remember one little girl, she was kind of shy. She didn't want to mix the chemicals because she thought they were going to blow up in her face. And I was like, no, don't worry. And my favorite experiment is elephant toothpaste. And I was like, honey, look, do my favorite with me. And she said, okay. What's elephant toothpaste? So elephant toothpaste is really cool. So it is hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodide and soap and all these other chemicals. And it starts out so tiny. And then you add the catalyst, potassium iodide, and it goes from this to this. It gets so big. That's why it's called elephant toothpaste. It's my favorite. And the girl's face lit up. She was smiling from ear to ear. She was like, Miss Jackie, oh my God, it blew up. And I was like, I know. It was amazing. <laughs> and that is my favorite memory because I saw her change from, oh, what is this? I don't think I can do it to, I'm going to do this. Like, I can do this. It was amazing. Um, you talked a lot about, you know, teaching these young girls and having a list of what you hope the young women that you work with now will go on to achieve. You're still only 16. What are we, besides working at SAP, where, where, can, we <laughs> see, where can we see you in, in 20 years? What, what, like, do you have an idea of where, your, where you would like your career to go or what you would like to do in life? Oh, I've had my plan since I was like four years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be a neurosurgeon, which is a brain surgeon. I find the brain so fascinating because we've been studying it for years and years, but yet we know so little. So I want to be that person who finds a cure for something or a new procedure for something. So 20 years, I've completed college. I'm living in a big house with a nice <laughs> car, maybe a Lamborghini or a Tesla. <laughs> And I am living the dream. I go to work every day and I clip aneurysms for people and make their lives better. And I'm doing a clinical trial for Alzheimer's and letting people know that I'm here for them. And maybe five years after that, I'm traveling the world doing pro bono surgeries in countries that need it. That's my plan. Oh my God, that's amazing, <laughs> amazing. Um, do you think, you're so involved and you're so much in giving back, do you, see that amongst your peers? Are you an encourager of that? How do you, there are people, young women in particular that are watching the live stream. How do you encourage some people that are like, I'm too busy, I have too much on, I'm trying to do my own thing, to what's, what, what's your message to them in terms of giving back? Because you're doing it in such, a, in such a valuable way at such a young age. So I often hear Jackie, how do you find the time to give back? And they say, I'm too busy. I say, you're not too busy. You make time to get your nails done, to go to the gym, to watch your favorite movie, watch Netflix, eat popcorn. I say, if you have time to do those things that make you happy, you have time to do something that can make someone else happy. And it's not even about giving 24 hours a day. You can give one hour. It all starts with one hour. If you can go to your community center and teach someone chess, teach someone how to play checkers or dance or anything that you're passionate about, you can make someone's life better. That one hour could really impact someone in a really big way. I tell them. Who's inspired you? Because you seem like it's, it just seems so innate in you. It, 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 is there it, who has inspired you? What ambitious people that you know and you don't know have inspired you along your journey? I have so many role models who have helped shape me into the young woman I am today. But to name a few, would have to be my mother, Joanne Means. I am so grateful to her because she's pushed me to be the absolute best person I can be. Even when I'm tired, my I don't want to get up. She's like, you got this. You know you want to help people, so just go do it. Another one is Miss Nichelle Polston. She is the creator of Her Normal, which is a company that is working towards getting women to embrace what's normal for them, whether it be something that's out of the norm for other women, wants them to embrace their hashtag Her Normal. Another woman is Congresswoman Lisa Blount Rochester. She is amazing. I had her speak at my very first Girls Empowerment STEM event. And an interesting fact, her husband actually died, I think, a couple months before she was supposed to run for her campaign. And she said that, you know what, I'm going to power through because I'm ambitious and I'm going to follow my dream, whether obstacles are here or not. And my final would have to be Dr. Alexa Kennedy. She was the first African-American female neurosurgeon, which is exactly what I want to be. So of course, I'm going to really look up to her. Have you met her? No, 
Oh, we should make that happen. Yeah. Anybody, <laughs> anybody know this person out there? We'll see Get what we can do. Surgery. <laughs> Where's she based? Um, and then Tori Birch, of course. I love that she has been so adamant in getting girls, we women, involved in embracing their ambition because women have been told they're too ambitious since the beginning of time. And I love that you're breaking that down and saying, you know what, ambition is a good thing. Those are my role models. Amazing. Okay, so the final question. Mm -hmm. Um, and no need to rush this, for people in this room and for people that are watching, if they can do anything to join in your mission, what, we, you know, what, w what would you have them do? For starters, I would say give one hour out of, even if it's 30 minutes, go to your community center, go to a church, go to a school, and give back in any way that you can, whether it's teaching dance, whether it's picking up trash, helping an older, elderly person out, do whatever you can. Um, and to help me personally, uh, I would say go to my website because I don't you know. If always you guys put the asking. What's yeah. the website? Yeah. So I don't know if you know, <laughs> STEM materials are crazy expensive. Like goggles, aprons, the little beakers and stuff that the girls like to mix, crazy expensive. So if you guys could give 50 cents, a dollar, to my website, stem queen.com. Once again, that's stem queen.com. <laughs> there is a little donate tab. Click that and go right there. Be like, you know what? I like what she said. I'll give her a dollar. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Jacqueline, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. That was great. And I have the very honorable, um, the great honor of introducing our next two people. And I'm going to go on for a while because they're two brilliant, brilliant women. Um, we know that ambition um, begins at home. It's actually my mom's 60th birthday today in Ireland. So I spent a lot of time on the phone with her. And it was just, I, I, I think coming to this event, I realized how much my mom had made me an, uh, an ambitious person and how she helped me steer into ambitious, uh, ambition then rather than um, detract away uh, from it. Um, and I love that tonight here we have something really special. We have Tori and her mother, Riva. Um, Riva, and who's an amazing woman. If you haven't met her, got a selfie. She's this lovely lady up the front. Um, she, she, Reva and her husband, Buddy, they raised Tori and her three brothers less than five miles away from here, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Anybody from Valley Forge? Oh, there we go in the back. Yeah, I see you. Uh, Reva is... Um, I've got it in my script. It says, Reva is Tori's greatest inspiration, but I will tell you, I went for breakfast with Tori a couple of weeks ago, and the way she talks about her mother being her inspiration is just so, so, so beautiful. Um, Tori herself is an amazing inspiration for many women across America and across the globe. She's the ultimate woman entrepreneur, and I'm gonna embarrass you with some facts and figures. She, when she launched her store and her designs, I think if you've heard um, Tori talk, you know that she wanted to do them parallel. She didn't, she didn't launch a fashion house and then later do a foundation. Those two things, helping women, were um, at the very, when she set out to, to work, um, they were the two things she had in mind. So she launched her store in 2004 and today has more than 250 stores globally. She's the executive chairman and chief creative officer and um, founder of the Tory Burch Foundation. And her foundation in partnership with Bank of America has deployed more than 40 million in loan capital for more than 2,000 women. Um, it's become the go-to resource for women entrepreneurs. Embrace Ambition has reached people in 90% of the world's countries. And even the women that came up and told me some of their stories today, people that have been following Embrace Ambition for years and getting so much energy and love out of it, whether they're starting their business or trying to be a social entrepreneur, has been really, really, um, really, really encouraging. Uh, when many people hear about Tori and her mother, Riva, they think maybe immediately about the iconic Riva flat. But what they don't know is that this flat is named for Tori's mother, who is the epitome of style, strength, and grace. Please join me in welcoming these two amazing women to the stage. Thank you. Okay, this is, should we put another chair up <laughs> Maybe this one. Can we switch the chairs or is it going to be a problem? Yeah, with the, you want to just try or you can, let's, let's see, Mom. Let's just. Why do we need another chair no, who's coming up here? Why don't you sit there? Um, okay, there. <laughs> if you was pushed me off the chair. There you go, can you, let's. All right, just a minute. Okay, I'm up. There you go. Hi. <laughs> Perfect. I wanted to switch the chair for me, not for you. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Well, this is inspiring. Uh, on the way here, um, I was reading stories from all of you, and it is truly humbling. And uh, there's close to 2,000, but I could get through about 10. And I was like, wow, that is beyond beautiful, all of your stories. So um, thank you to your incredible partnership. Thank you, Samantha. Um, to come, for coming down. You, you both are, are women that I admire, and um, we all need to stick together because, uh, as we know, women together are the future, and I truly believe that, and I learned that from my mother. Um, Thank every, you. Every time, <laughs> every time um, I, people say, what was the inspiration to your company? It was my mother. Where did you come up with the designs? My mother. Every single thing come back, comes back to my mom. But really, I was a tomboy growing up on a farm and had very glamorous In a tree. Parents. In a tree. <laughs> I lived outside. I had three brothers, and I had no interest in fashion. And um, But I had very fashionable parents, and so I would always watch my mother get dressed, and I would be in awe. And you'd come out in this gold lame outfit. I will never forget it. So, Neither will um, I. <laughs> but I'm going, I'm going to ask you questions. This is going to be an official interview, so I'm going to read them. Um, I hope I can answer you, Tori. The, the women in our family have been deeply connected to the arts. And in fact, my grandmother, your mother, was. What, what did you learn from, from your mother that well, shaped you? I had a mother that worshipped me. So how could I not love her, right? <laughs> she was wonderful in every sense of the word. She was all for her children and protected me from a divine, very strict father. <laughs> and was my protector and made me feel that I could do anything in this world I wanted to do. And I could tell you a million stories they're called momisms that were in my family. Ooh, and what did she do for a living that she gave well, up? Well, that's so interesting because in those days, women, of course, were in, in trouble. My mother was a concert violinist and the first woman orchestra leader in this country. And um, Not that we inherited those talents. Oh, it's that. <laughs> Now, everyone in my family are opera singers, artists, everything. When I went to college, I was put on stage to sing because I was comic relief. <laughs> they laughed until they were blue, and I was teary and crying because I really meant what I was doing. So that set me back a little well, bit. Well, that, that's a good segue into your college years. Um, you were an assistant to a casting director at CBS. After, uh, after college. After college, sorry. Yeah. After college. Um, that could not have been an easy job. That being was a woman. empowering. It was. Yes. And even though you're an assistant, you got, you got a lot done. I was an assistant. I was a receptionist. Okay. <laughs> However, and that was the beginning of knowing the power I had that I used to, everyone thought it was so outgoing and so this and so that. In the meantime, my knees were knocking and I was going to faint and I needed some water quickly but I never showed it. But when I got this job, it was amazing. I was the receptionist for the casting director of CBS. Now, you don't think that's much. When I tell you every actor, from Marlon Brando and Steve <laughs> McQueen on down and up, wanted their resume on Robert Dale Martin's desk, and I was the only one that could give it to them. <laughs> and Bob Martin, was a divine man and totally for me and stayed <laughs> to okay. my best friend for years. <laughs> was but but so, no, and so I always think my mom could have been an incredible entrepreneur, and you were, um, yeah. but you decided to be a stay-at-home mom yourself oh, and, that was and give up an, an acting career and you had a radio station. But if you were to press rewind, what would you be today? And how, if, ooh, how would you? If what? If you were to rewind and, and do it again, and you had a career, what would it be? I would be what I was, because I was very gratified. I had been many interests that I could do from my home and still be the mother I wanted to be, because I absolutely adored my children, which meant they adored me, because I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> But I could do and share with them all the things that I loved, from gardening to uh, my, our 
kennel? Yeah, well, not many people know that. We had, my mom had a kennel with my father, and we had, at any given time, 40 German Shepherds. And so I was always outside playing with puppies, but, and you had Grand Victors. And, I whelped 100 and, litters. And showed them. So it was, and it was a business. It was, we turned, well, business. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> it was I, just what it cost us to feed them, but you can say it, we didn't make too much, but it was, it was a business in that I learned how to do things, as I did, if we can segue into my flower business, that I, I had a father that adored flowers. He was a very strict judge, lawyer and a judge, but he loved his gardens when they were victory gardens, which none of you know about, but that's what they were called in the Second World War. And he introduced me to gardening, and I was passionate about that, too. So... And you started a flower business. And can I just tell oh, one sure. story? Please do. Mom started a flower business and realized that you didn't have enough help to help you with your very big event in Atlantic City. <laughs> so all of a sudden, my brothers and I were the, the, the star job. workers. And we were learning on the job how to do these magnificent centerpieces from our mother. But it was a lot of hard work. No, it was terrifying because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. But that was good, because I knew when it was over that, and it turned out magnificently. I had a budget, a huge budget, that went down to this much money. <laughs> and I had to, I had made trees for my farm for centerpieces and, and got gladioli, of all things, but took them off the branches and made little orchids that they look like, and hung all my fruit, grapes and everything. And it was divine. I was booked from then on. It was my very first job at 1,000 people for 100 tables in a casino. And we were exhausted, by the way. <laughs> and yeah, you got out, but my son back there, <laughs> who never picked up anything, he came down there to be comped. And he and my poor aunt, my poor aunt, who was 70 years old, who wanted, came down to just watch, was then sweeping floors in the basement <laughs> just to get me out of there. And when it was all over, and it was such a success, I, cl I really just crashed. <laughs> she had to take me to a spa for a week <laughs> till I could find out who I was again. It was a, that one, was my first One job. thing I admire most about my mom is uh, you don't listen to stereotypes. You've never oh, been no. typecast. Uh, people like, there's perception and there's reality. And I think... For me, I've been I've experienced that that people have a very different perception of who I am, and I think I hope they're pleasantly surprised once they get to know who I am. And mom, I've I've learned that from you because you have been fearless your whole life. You've been your own person. You moved out to a farm in the middle of nowhere where we grew up to do your own thing and be about family. So tell me about how you've remained so fearless throughout your life. I've, I've always had energy, had to put things, I, want, I wanted everything. And I was passionate about a lot of things. My gardening, I was passionate about my children. I was passionate about my husband. There were so many things. And I felt the farm, and of course I had to have a farm for my dogs, our dogs which was an accident that we got into dogs, but that's another story. Um, I'll tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a boyfriend. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a big fight, and we broke up. And then um, I went back to New York, and blah, 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 blah. And anyway, he, we made up. He said, Reva, while you were gone, I was very lonely, so I bought a dog. <laughs> that I've was never the heard this place. story exactly. <laughs> well, that's how we got into oh, dogs. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, that's okay. a, a very different. So, oh, there's a lot of things you don't know about <laughs> oh, <my> yet. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> anyway, that's how we got into dogs. He called me, said, would you be interested in showing this dog that I bought? Because the breeder wanted to, um, to didn't, couldn't afford to... Uh, show him, and we were. It, it was, he had bought the dog from him, so I said, "Sure." Well, it turned into such an incredible 
33 homebred champions, 100 pup, well, puppies. Puppies, I will always remember the puppies. That was my um, favorite. It was the most exciting, exhilarating, and it was something that we could do with our children. And we traveled all over. We had Youth Victor in the United States, Canadian Grand Victor. It was a very lovely time in our life. But that segued into my flowers. There was always about my family. Now, I don't want to brag. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. But I, this woman, well, first of all, she lived in a tree. <laughs> and now we're getting personal. <laughs> she was a tomboy till she was about 45. It's still a tomboy. <laughs> <laughs> she still is. But, excuse me, Jamie, she could beat out every brother <laughs> in running match, in tennis, in anything that... Um, well, Mom made me let Jamie win, but I, I'm just telling him that for the first time. But no, we had we had fun. If you if you were to give, I always ask entrepreneurs, what, what is the most valuable thing that you can get? What and it's always advice and mentors. So you're my mentor. What would be the advice you would tell women that want to start a business or that have an idea? First of all, you have to like yourself, and you have to have a goal. And it may change as you move on, but you have to know that you're a terrific person inside, and no one can take you down. Once Wait, before you, you go on, because there are many times when I had so much self-doubt growing up, and I hear my mom's voice saying, you're Tori Robinson. Don't you know who you are? Every single time, and, and building up yourself and building up your children or your friends or your loved ones is so important, but you have to really believe in yourself, and I think I learned that from, from you, and, and certainly you, you've said it thousands of times to me. At least. <laughs> but I must say, when Tori was little, she was like a koala bear. She was so shy so shy, and she would hang on to my leg like a koala bear. I just felt like I had three legs, and I walked with her that way. And I said, to "Buddy, I don't." My husband, I don't know about her. He said, I th <laughs> "Okay, that's off the record." <laughs> he said, "I think we may have to buy her a husband." <laughs> okay, where are my brothers? <laughs> I said, "Not on my life. She's going to be divine." I'm still very shy, and I've learned, I think it's all about all being out of your comfort zone. And, and certainly, in, with all these incredible women in business, to perpetually be out of your comfort zone is something I think we're all used to. I'm not sure about you. You seem pretty comfortable. <laughs> You're comfortable <Very> everywhere. <laughs> but that's a gift. And, and I think for me, it's taken a long time to even feel comfortable about speaking in public, to speak to women about some of the issues that we all face and some of the challenges. And, and I, I, I look at you, Mom, and it's been such a role model. You, you seem to do it so effortlessly. And the hours I would watch my mother in the garden, and I was talking to uh, Thomas, my nephew, and I said, what is one of your best memories uh, that, uh, of, of Gaga? He calls her Gaga. And he said that she came to Grandparents' Day and sat for hours digging worms <laughs> with all the kids. And that's when he knew that he, he, he's a kindred spirit of yours. What, what, how did, I know your father introduced you to farming, but I'm very interested in flowers because of you. And the idea of organic gardening was so different for the 70s. It wasn't, it didn't so exist. It didn't exist. Women. And my mom always talked about pesticides and organic gardeners. And, and I, it, it upset me so to spray something that I was going to eat. And I found this little book, Ruth Stout and Organic Gardening. And I was mesmerized by it. Even today, I'm such an adv advocate of, of uh, organic gardening, but it's very difficult because if your neighbor is spraying, it comes, wafts through, you know, you have to take a whole neighborhood and, and fence them in. But it was such a challenge and so exciting to me to take vegetables and freeze them for the winter. And my children ate always clean food, which is now an expression today. Green food, clean food. And I was really, I didn't 
I learned, I just got books and books and read and read, and it was one of the most gratifying days of my life, and I still, now I left my farm, which was a lot of ground, and I'm on an acre, and I have a garden this big, and the rest is a house. <laughs> and um, I still keep that little something going. That's, that's for sure. It, it's amazing, the, the gardening. Um, but let me say about you and gardening. I had another job, my first, another first, and my, but I had learned to have um, women and men work for me and do uh, some of the centerpieces. No one showed up. And I had this huge party, and Tori came in from college. That was another time, that's true. <laughs> that, yeah, I was put to work a lot, but you, I love it now. But you did, you said, what? <laughs> I said, will you help me come and make flowers. I don't like flowers. I, have nothing to I really do. didn't love doing she that. She said, I'm not going to do that. I said, Tori, I need you. I need you. I'm, look at a good mother I've been all my life to you. <laughs> okay, that's guilt. And I definitely, definitely did it. If you did can't it. beat them, you can make them feel guilty. <laughs> Remember that. What, one thing growing up that we were always... Um, always did every night is had family dinners and I think it's so important I really tried with my children to have family dinners you learn a lot but you talked about women's issues Lovely, and and I just remember those conversations they were always lively it was always a cast of characters around our dinner table what made you so interested in women's issues well because I mean, we're all interested in women's issues. I have to see who's here, because I <laughs> we I'm need only men to be kidding, interested. but you know we're smarter than men. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to guide them a little bit. As a matter of fact, just recently, they just <laughs> there was a study. Women are constantly thinking there's 100 things going on in their brain. Men have an empty spot in their <laughs> brain. <laughs> but The but frontal lobe, it needs to develop. <laughs> No, but it's real. And when a woman says to a man, what are you thinking? And he says, nothing. He really is not thinking. So excuse any man in the audience. We love you and adore you, no, but we, what, a little guy. OK, so we're winding up. But one thing about our, <laughs> about our Embrace Ambition Summit. Oh, yeah, that back to the <laughs> it's, it's so important is that we've always, from day one, knew how important it was to have men part of this conversation. Yeah. And having men part of the conversation, it's interesting because when I speak to men, often when I speak to fathers about their daughters, they really get interested. But across the board, I'm seeing a change. I'm seeing a change in my, in my boys. I'm seeing the idea of embracing ambition is something that they feel is how it should be in, in women. And that is really exciting and it's it's about time i think equal pay it should be a given it's 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 not equal rights should be a given it's um we're interested in humanity and and to me um to have a, a platform like our team has 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 done such an extraordinary job to help be advocates to promote that. Um, I'm so happy that we can. I want to say thank you to our team, because I would not be here. We, we did launch the, the foundation in 2009. We did some great work. But we wanted to be very careful about talking about it externally, because we wanted to be very careful about it ever being perceived as marketing in any way. It was very core to who we are, and it was an internal conversation. I would say. Um, Lori coming on board and Gabrielle and the whole team has has been the change agent we needed. Um, it's been the last, how long have you been there? Three years? Four. Okay, so four years and it is so exciting um, to have real impact and scale and that is that has always been our goal. Um, I'll tell one quick story. When I went to raise money for the company, um, I, I said, I want to build a, a foundation, and I want to, uh, well, I said, I want to build a global business so I could start a foundation. And I was looking at men on the couch, and they were looking at me, and they were like almost patting me on the back as if it were charity work. And they looked at, one person in particular looked at me, and he said, don't ever say business and purpose in the same sentence. And I looked at him knowing that I was going to come back to him with that thought. Um, last December, I called him and I said, you know what? Hey, it's me. I said, I remember our conversation in 2010. 
And I said, you know, I just came from a conference, and it was Forbes and Fortune, and it was doing good is good for business. And he said, okay, what do you want? And I said, well, naturally, a check for the foundation. And he said, <laughs> gave us a great check, and he said, just for this year. And, and I said, yes, until next December. Thank you so much. But we need to change the conversation. It needs to be a given, not a favor. And I appreciate you all for coming so much. I appreciate my mom for being here and for being the constant inspiration. And the best part about tonight is hearing from people and hearing their stories. And to start with that was brilliant. Hearing all of your stories is quite remarkable. Uh, I'm going to introduce the next two. Um, we're going to close. And I, I'm going to welcome Ariane Long, the founder and CEO of Family. And following Ariane would be Rachel, Rachel I want to get this right, Veniola. Vanilla. Okay. Um, the founder and CEO of Kova. So I'm so excited to have you here and Thanks can't wait for you all to hear. Worry. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I am the founder and chief estrogen officer at Femly. And we're a badass tech company that manufactures and delivers healthier alternatives to toxic feminine care. We increase access, health education, and product diversity to people in need around the world. Most importantly, we break down barriers and stereotypes that affect women of color through outreach and a sustainable product line. As an African-American female founder in tech, I'm basically a unicorn. But like many entrepreneurs, I was motivated to start my business based on a personal experience. In the midst of my efforts and just before reaching my goals, I suffered a late-term stillbirth. On May 19th of 2018, I lost my daughter Sage and almost lost my life after being diagnosed with E. coli septicemia and spending days on life support with hemorrhaging and organ failure. Tragically, many reproductive issues that face all women have higher rates in the black community. In the weeks during my recovery, I was shocked to discover that black women were five times more likely to experience fetal loss or death in pregnancy and labor due to racism as cited by the NIH. Since then, I've extended my outreach to include not only feminine care access, but all issues that face women, including gender equity and access to capital. Last year, the number of women-owned small businesses grew by 58%, while the number of black-owned women businesses grew 164%. In fact, women are the only demographic, black women are the only demographic whose small business growth surpassed that of the same male demographic. Why is this important? It's important because just 2% of venture capital funding goes to women and 0.2% goes to women of color. So I want you all to take a moment to look at some of the badass women around you. Overall, odds are that you're standing or seated next to a rock star woman who deserves better. So with that, I say let's continue the fight while also putting our money and resources where our mouth is through investing in women and more specifically women of color. Desmond Tutu famously said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So tonight, I ask that you embrace ambition and embrace it with those around you. I survived so that I could be the change I wanted to see in the world through my advocacy, education, and work with family. I'm building awareness of these issues and believe that we can change the world. I hope that you'll follow the journey because the future is family and follow us at familybox.com. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Bignola. So from my first memories as a child, I was told by my abusive alcoholic stepfather that I was ugly, worthless, and a whore during his nightly drinking binges. And I was determined to succeed and get out of that hellhole. And that's exactly what I did. After earning a full scholarship to college, I founded a specialized mentoring program for at-risk Hispanic youth that grew up like I did, encouraging them to rise above the stereotypes against women and beyond their self-limiting beliefs. 
After getting my master's in clinical psychology, I realized that I had gone into the field to find some answers about my life, and next I decided to switch gears. So I took a career strengths test, and the results highly suggested becoming an entrepreneur. Never something I considered before or even heard the word entrepreneur. And the light bulb went off. So I promptly demanded to be admitted into business school on the spot, which I was, and earned an MBA in entrepreneurship and leadership. So when I was a kid, biking was my escape from my home life, and I want to provide that sense of freedom and liberation to others worldwide. A bike share program had just launched in Philadelphia at the time, and I noticed that few people were wearing helmets. This reminded me of a family friend who became blind from not wearing a helmet during a bike crash, and this motivated me to do something really bold. So I camped out at bike share stations and asked riders why they weren't wearing helmets. And most of them said to me it was because helmets were inconvenient and unattractive. This is how the Kova helmet was born. So even though I'm a Jersey girl and I studied psychology, I'm now the only foldable, customizable helmet manufacturer in the United States and one of the few female-owned companies in the helmet industry. I'm also on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list and one of the top seven women in STEM on Forbes, and I'm still pushing with everything inside of me to get my dreams to be real and make get the cove on every single person that I can. Thank you so much and embrace ambition. Thank you, Rachel, and, and thank you to all our speakers, Ariane, Anna, Emily, Jennifer, Samantha, Jacqueline, Tori, and Reva, of course, who I could not adore anymore. <laughs> On the Foundation website, ToriBirchFoundation.org, you'll find both an ambition guidebook and um, a tool for dealing with unconscious bias and uh, stereotypes called Think Twice, Think Inclusively. We encourage you to not only use these guides, go to the website, download them, but share them with others. That's one thing that everybody in this room could do. You could share that information and that knowledge with others. Um, and of course, on our website, you'll find a myriad of resources for women entrepreneurs. And that's something tell anybody that you know who is an entrepreneur that they should avail themselves out of. To our live stream guests, thank you for joining us. Let's all wave. Hi. Bye. Um, <laughs> not quite yet. Tomorrow night, we'll be streaming from Chicago at 6.30 Central Time with two incredible women. I'm headed there right after this. Tina Chen, who was um, the uh, chief of staff for Michelle Obama and one of the key people in the Time's Up movement, and Maria Wazir, the uh, squash player from Pakistan. So don't forget to watch. Thank you and good night to everybody on live stream. For our guests here with us now.